What's up, punks? It's Shinobi, and this is episode 8 of Shy 256. So this is going to be a little bit different. I'm pretty much just re-recording a talk I gave at the Free States uh, Blockchain and Digital Assets Conference uh, that Bruce Fenton invited me to last month. So I'm just going to dive into it. Um, the talk was on abstraction models for reasoning about second layers. And the, the big example I'm going to use through the talk is the Lightning Network, uh, because it's, it's something most of you should be very familiar with. Um, and I'm betting the mental model that you use to reason about the Lightning Network is pretty much just dots connected by lines. So a, a graph with uh, the connections between nodes. That's wrong. Um, that is completely wrong and absolutely not what the Lightning Network is at a fundamental level. And hopefully by the end of this, um, I will convince you all that I'm not crazy and what I just said actually makes a lot of sense. So um, Lightning is, is it's pretty much a stack of a bunch of individual protocols that all play different roles in coordinating the creation of pre-signed transactions. And what a lightning channel is, is um, these pre-signed transactions. It's not just a line between nodes. Now, what that looks like now is two asymmetrical sets of pre-signed transactions that each uh, party in the channel has. And submitting your own returns the other side's money immediately, but um, requires you to wait for a time lock to expire and submit the second transaction to get your own money back. And really, if you, you go look at the, the stack of protocols, you know, you'll see that it's, it's a very modular plug and play thing. So at, at the very base, we, we have the transport layer because this, this is an interactive process between two parties, you have to have a way to communicate um, and share data to create these transactions. Now, above this, we have the, the base feature negotiation layer because you know these types of protocols don't have a global consensus layer. So you need a way for two parties to figure out what each of them do and do not support. They need to find that overlap before they can actually do anything. Now above this is a layer I've introduced called the construct layer. This is pretty much the structure and the format that these pre-signed transactions take. And above that is the update layer, um, which is effectively how you guarantee only the most recent um, state is actually submitted and confirmed on chain. Above this is the, the transfer layer um, where HTLCs happen to link up a payment atomically across multiple separate channels. Above that, the multi-hop layer where the Sphinx protocol is used to onion encrypt everything so that a hop only knows the preceding hop and the hop ahead of it. And then above that, the routing protocol to actually find and coordinate the creation of multi-hop routes. So, you know, thinking about that, a lot of these specific versions of things now can be um, plug and played with. Um, and to kind of go into the first example of that first, I want to get into, you know, kind of a problem with the existing implementation of Lightning. There is no clean separation between that update layer and that construct layer. Because the whole update mechanism used now based on penalty transactions um, is baked into the construct. Like that, that works when we create a new channel state in a channel. I literally just give you the, the penalty keys for the last state on my side and you give me yours. And, you know, the, the underlying assumption is uh, both of us know if either one tries to submit an old state, we can now confiscate all of their money. That's the, the guarantee that only the most recent one confirms on chain. But it's baked into the construct layer. So there, there is no clean separation of an update mechanism that can be applied to any type of construct. Now enter L2, uh, the proposal uh, coming out of Blockstream for a new update mechanism. Uh, this is both generally applicable and cleanly separates the update and construct layer by uh, making the, the base construct symmetrical. So now instead of uh, each side of the channel having a different set of transactions, they both have the same. 
Um, and this is accomplished by effectively um, creating a new SIG hash flag, um, which is pretty much um, something that lets you specify which part of the transactions a signature is committing to. And this new SIG hash flag effectively lets you commit to just the script of a transaction and not the specific transaction output from a specific transaction. And so now <clears throat> we can create this new structure um, for a channel where instead of the commitment and the time lock refund, uh, what you have is a trigger transaction whose purpose is to stop um, the time lock um, from beginning to tick until people submit that trigger transaction and then an update for channel states that spends the trigger. Now the, the trick here is that because you can now specify just a script and not a specific transaction output, um, these update transactions in the new construct can spend each other. So you can have an old channel um, update transaction hit the chain and then the most recent one can spend that before the time lock path allows the old um, transaction giving everybody uh, their money back confirms. And so now there is a clean separation between the update and the construct layer. The update mechanism is applicable to constructs generally and we've removed the whole issue of old states leading to penalties. Um, they just now guarantee that everybody gets the money they're supposed to. So to dive back into the, the lightning stack now, um, you know, there's even more layers you can plug and play with. Uh, the transfer layer, for instance, um, there is both a PTLC, a point time lock contract and Schnorr adapter signatures um, as plug and play alternatives to HTLCs. Um, now one, um, the PTLC would require a new opcode, uh, adapter signatures require Schnorr but they both mathematically work the same way in that they guarantee atomic linkages across multiple channels for a payment, but um, they use a different piece of data for each hop. So you obscure the connections in the whole payment um, along each hop. And as well, it also mitigates a wormhole attack. Um, you can Google that if you're interested. Uh, the TLDR is <clears throat> that routes or nodes in a route for a payment can collude to steal fees from people in between them but um, that addresses that as well but the, the overall point is that this is is plug and play now to go back to the, the construct there um, l2 being introduced and creating this clean separation um, is generally applicable. so now um, we can do symmetrical n of n channels instead of just two of two and what I mean by this is you can have an arbitrary amount of people in a single channel now because um, you have a clean update mechanism. Whereas with the, the penalty based one prior, there's no way to work that out between more than two people because who gets to penalize somebody by taking money um, when there's more than two people in the channel? It gets very combinatorically difficult. I mean, it's just not possible. But with L2, um, we can do this now to create um, channel factories with an N, and N, or N of N construct as opposed to a two of two. Now that this would work pretty much just like um, L2, um, except there's multiple people um, funding it and the multi-sig has more than two participants, but otherwise it's just the same. You add your transaction after the update transaction that gives everybody the appropriate balances. Everybody updates it together and you can now have more than one person in a channel. Now the interesting thing here is that these are all pre-signed transactions. Um, that's all a construct is. So you can stack constructs um, pretty much in a channel factory um, this, this would look like just building smaller N of N um, channels on top of the base until you get to just two of two channels on top. And this would look pretty much just like an extended tree of pre-signed transactions instead of the much simpler um, line, I guess you could say, with two people involved in it. But it, it works. And you know this type of generalization 
it is where this protocol is going in the long term. Like it's not just lines between points like I said at the beginning of this. And now here's where I might lose some of you. Um, I'm introducing state chains into the construct layer on this protocol stack. Um, for, for those of you who aren't familiar, um, the quick rundown of the idea is it, it works kind of like a, a lightning channel, except there is a federator involved. And pretty much the, the trick of this is you have a output um, and a pre-signed transaction spending it that sends to a script that can be spent either by this federation and what we call the transitory key or it can be spent by a single key, the current owner, um, with a time lock. And so what this does is it allows you to hand over the transitory key, like actually give that key to somebody, um, have the federation sign a receipt of this transfer and create a new state chain transaction where the time lock refund goes to this new person instead of the, the previous owner. And now this is kind of trust-based in that the federation can collude with a previous owner to rip you off, but it's an opt-in construct. And the, the beauty is here, you know, constructs are stackable. So you can build lightning channels and things on top of, of these state chains. But ultimately, it is a pre-signed transaction, um, just like all of the other types of, of channel constructs we've gone over so far. So why not just treat it like a part of the lightning network? I mean, it's an interactive thing. You need to replicate all of that stuff. So why not do that? Now, to give you maybe a, a few arguments for why not do that, um, let's you know think about a, a payment being routed on the lightning network. Okay, let's say that Alice is trying to pay Bob, but there is some choke point between them where there is no liquidity from that point onward to actually route that payment to Bob. So you can't make that payment, right? Wrong. But let's say Charlie, the last node um, before that choke point, has a state chain um, that he's managing with his lightning node. And let's say a few other people on the other side of this choke point um, you know, trust this state chain federator. Um, so Charlie can just open a channel on top of that state chain without going on chain with any of those people, atomically add the HTLC or whatever you're using to route the payment on top of that and route this payment to Bob. And so as you can see, a state chain allows you to kind of on the fly fill in liquidity gaps for routing payments without having to go on chain. The only caveat is both sides have to trust the federation involved in that state chain. And the beauty of this is that's um, kind of firewalled. Like, let's say hypothetically Alice routes this payment to Bob through Charlie using a state chain, and Charlie and the federation for that state chain collude and rip off the, the person that took the other side of that. Um, that doesn't affect anybody else in that payment. Alice still relinquished control of her money. Bob still received control of that money. It's only Charlie and the person he paid over the state chain that have any involvement with that, that are affected in any way. And in that, it's only the person Charlie paid that loses anything. It's partitioned away. So that, that difference in trust model between the other constructs and the state chain construct does not matter for anybody outside of that construct. So it's opt-in and it still fills in these liquidity gaps atomically and that different trust model has no effect on anybody except the, the parties of that one construct in that, that payment round. So this is a very um, nice property when you're talking about composing all of these things. Different trust models don't bleed over into other constructs participating in a multi-construct payment. Another example is, you know, the, the problems with onboarding people into these um, second layers. You know, with a block size limit, there's kind of a limitation on how many people who can transact on chain. So there's a limitation on how many people can onboard into these second layers. Well, state chains solve that. 
um, these constructs are stackable. So you can just bring people into this state chain, which is done completely off chain, build a channel factory on top of that state chain, and then simply by confirming the, the state chain channel um, transaction on chain, confirming that, finalizing, and closing out the state chain, but leaving all of the channel factory transactions not submitted to chain, you can get an arbitrary amount of people into this channel factory and with a, like a transaction or two, close it out completely and just leave the trustless channel factory operating above the chain. And so, like again, it's this kind of interesting dynamic when you start looking at this just in terms of constructs and how you can link them together. That temporary period of trust, which might even be able to be mitigated by atomically linking that through HTLCs or something um, of this state chain federation, at, um, leads to massive scalability in onboarding people into these other trustless constructs. And then just the couple transactions, it's done. It's trustless now. So it's that temporary period of trust to get into something trustless in a way more scalable way. And so I'll end it here, hopefully, with you realizing I'm not crazy with the statement, is it even going to make sense to call any of this the Lightning Network in five years, in 10 years, with how radically different and, and modular and composable it becomes? I don't think so. So maybe everybody should start trying to wrap their heads around it in that term. Like think about it in those terms so that we don't wind up trying to shove things in a much inferior direction. And so I hope you've enjoyed this, uh, found it educational, and I'll see you later, punk.